Section 2 of Scott's Last Expedition, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russ Clough, Stoughton, Massachusetts. Scott's Last Expedition, Volume 1. The Journals of Robert Falcon Scott. Arranged by Leonard Huxley. Second part of Chapter 1 through stormy seas. Saturday, December 3. Yesterday the wind slowly fell towards evening. Less water was taken on board, therefore less found its way below, and it soon became evident that our bailing was gaining on the engine room. The work was steadily kept going in two hour shifts. By 10 p.m. the hole in the engine room bulkhead was completed, and Lieutenant Evans, wriggling over the coal, found his way to the pump shaft and down it. He soon cleared the suction of the coal balls, a mixture of coal and oil, which choked it, and to the joy of all a good stream of water came from the pump for the first time. From this moment it was evident we should get over the difficulty, and though the pump choked again on several occasions, the water in the engine room steadily decreased. It was good to visit that spot this morning, and to find that the water no longer swished from side to side. In the forenoon fires were laid and lighted. The hand pump was got into complete order and sucked the bilges almost dry, so that great quantities of coal and ashes could be taken out. Now all is well again, and we are steaming and sailing steadily south within two points of our course. Campbell and Bowers have been busy relisting everything on the upper deck. This afternoon we got out the two dead ponies through the forecastle skylight. It was a curious proceeding, as the space looked quite inadequate for their passage. We looked into the ice house and found it in the best order. Though we are not yet safe, as another gale might have disastrous results, it is wonderful to realize the change which has been wrought in our outlook in twenty-four hours. The others have confessed the gravely serious view of our position which they shared with me yesterday, and now we are all hopeful again. As far as one can gather, besides the damage to the bulwarks of the ship, we have lost two ponies, one dog, ten tons of coal, sixty-five gallons of petrol, in a case of the biologist's spirit, serious loss enough, but much less than I expected. All things considered, we have come off lately, but it was bad luck to strike a gale at such a time. The third pony, which was down in a sling for some time, and the gale is again on its feet. It looks a little groggy, but may pull through if we don't have another gale. Osman, our best sledge dog, was very bad this morning but he has been lying warmly in hay all day, and is now much better. Several more were in a very bad way, and needed nursing back to life. The sea and wind seem to be increasing again, and there is a heavy southerly swell. But the glass is high. We ought not to have another gale till it falls. Footnote from Dr. Wilson's Journal I must say I enjoyed it all from beginning to end, and as one bunk became unbearable after another, owing to the wet, and the comments became more and more to the point as people searched out dry spots here and there to finish the night in oilskins and greatcoats on the cabin or wardroom seats. I thought what things were becoming interesting. Some of the staff were like dead men with seasickness. Even so, Cherry Garrard and Wright and Day turned out with the rest of us, and alternately worked and were sick. I have no seasickness on these ships myself under any conditions, so I enjoyed it all, and as I have the run of the bridge, and can ask as many questions as I choose, I knew all that was going on. All Friday and Friday night we worked in two parties, two hours on and two hours off. It was heavy work filling and handing up huge buckets of water as fast as they could be given from one to the other, from the very bottom of the stokehole to the upper deck, up little metal ladders all the way. One was, of course, wet through the whole time in a sweater and trousers and sea boots, and every two hours one took these off and hurried in for a rest in a greatcoat, to turn out again in two hours and put in the same cold sopping clothes, and so on until 4 a.m. on Saturday, when we were bailed out between four and five tons of water and had so lowered it that it was once more possible to light fires and try the engines and the steam pump again and to clear the valves in the inlet which had once more within reach. The fires had been put out at 11.40 a.m. and were then out for twenty-two hours while we bailed. It was a weird night's work, with the howling gale and the darkness and the immense seas running over the ship every few minutes, and no engines and no sail, 
and we all in the engine room black as ink with the engine room oil and bilge pumps singing chanties as we passed up slopping buckets full of bilge each man above slopping a little over the heads of all below him wet through to the skin so much so that some of the party worked altogether naked like chinese coolies and the rush of the wave backwards and forwards at the bottom grew hourly less in the dim light of a couple of engine room oil lamps whose light just made the darkness visible the ship all the time rolling like a sodden lifeless log her league gunwale under water every time december three we were all at work till four a m and then were all told off to sleep till eight a m at nine thirty a m we were all on to the main hand pump and lo and behold it worked and we pumped and pumped till twelve thirty when the ship was once more only as full of bilge water as she always is and the position was practically solved there was one thrilling moment in the midst of the worst hour on friday when we were realizing that the fires must be drawn and when every pump had failed to act and when the bulwarks began to go to pieces and the petrol cases were all afloat and going overboard and the word was suddenly passed in a shout from the hands at work on the waist of the ship trying to save petrol cases that smoke was coming up through the seams in the afterhold as this was full of coal and patent fuel and was next to the engine room and it, as it had not been opened for the airing it required to get rid of gas on account of the flood of water on deck making it impossible to open the hatchways the possibility of a fire there was patent to every one and it could not possibly have been dealt with in any way short of opening the hatches and flooding the ship when she must have floundered it was therefore a thrilling moment or two until it was discovered that the smoke was really steam arising from the bilge at the bottom having risen to the heated coal end of footnote monday december five latitude fifty six degrees forty minutes the barometer has been almost steady since saturday the wind rising and falling slightly but steady in direction from the west from a point off course we have crept up to the course itself everything looks prosperous except the ponies up to this morning in spite of favorable wind and sea the ship has been pitching heavily to a southwesterly swell this has tried the animals badly especially those under the forecastle we had thought the ponies on the port side to be pretty safe but two of them seemed to me to be groggy and i doubt if they could stand more heavy weather without a spell of rest i pray there be no more gales we should be nearing the limits of the westerlies but one cannot be sure for at least two days there is still a swell from the southwest though it is not nearly so heavy as yesterday but I devoutly wish it would vanish altogether. So much depends on fine weather. December ought to be a fine month in the Ross Sea. It always has been, and just now conditions point to fine weather. Well, we must be prepared for anything, but I'm anxious, anxious about these animals of ours. The dogs have quite recovered since the fine weather. They are quite in good form again. Our deck cargo is getting reduced. All the coal is off the upper deck, and the petrol is restored in better fashion, as far as that is concerned, we should not mind another blow. Campbell and Bowers have been untiring in getting things straight on the deck. The idea of making our station Cape Crozier has again come on the tapas. There would be many advantages. The ease of getting there at an early date. The fact that none of the autumn or summer parties could be cut off. The fact that the main barrier could be reached without crossing crevasses, and that the track to the pole would be due south from the first. The mild condition and absence of blizzards at the penguin rookery, the opportunity of studying the emperor penguin incubation, and the new interest in the geology of Terra, besides minor facilities such as the getting of ice, stones for shelter, etc. The disadvantages mainly consist in the possible difficulty of landing stores. A swell would make things very unpleasant, and might possibly prevent the landing of the horses and motors. Then again, it would be certain that some distance of bare rock would have to be traversed before a good snow surface was reached from the hut, and possibly a climb of three or four hundred feet would intervene. Again, it might be difficult to handle the ship while stores were being landed, owing to current, bergs, and flow ice. It remains to be seen, but the prospect is certainly alluring. At a pinch, we could land the ponies in McMurdo Sound and let them walk around. The sun is shining brightly this afternoon. Everything is drying and I think the swell continues to subside. Tuesday, December 6. Latitude, 59 degrees 7 minutes. Longitude, 177 degrees 51 minutes east. Made good south, 17 east, 153, 457 minutes to circle. The promise of yesterday has been fulfilled. 
The swell has continued to subside, and this afternoon we go so steadily that we have much comfort. I am truly thankful, mainly for the sake of the ponies. Poor things, they look thin and scraggy enough, but generally brighter and fitter. There is no doubt the forecastle is a bad place for them, but in any case some must have gone there. The four midship ponies, which were expected to be subject to the worst conditions, have had much better time than their fellows. A few ponies have swollen legs, but all are feeding well. The wind failed in the morning watch, and later a faint breeze came from the eastward. The barometer has been falling, but not on a steep gradient. It is still above normal. This afternoon it is overcast with a scotch mist. Another day ought to put us beyond the reach of westerly gales. We still continue to discuss the project of landing at Cape Prozier, and the prospect grows more fascinating as we realize it. For instance, we ought from such a base to get an excellent idea of the barrier movement and of the relative movement amongst the pressure ridges. There is no doubt it would be a tremendous stroke of luck to get safely landed there with all our paraphernalia. Everyone is very cheerful. One hears laughter and song all day. It's delightful to be with such a merry crew. A week from New Zealand today. Wednesday, December 7. Latitude 61 degrees 22 minutes. Longitude 179 degrees 56 minutes west. Made good. South 25. East 150. Antarctic Circle 313 minutes. The barometer descended on a steep regular gradient all night, turning suddenly to an equally steep upgrade this morning. With the turn, a smart breeze sprang up from the southwest and forced us three points off our course. The sea has remained calm, seeming to show that the ice is not far off. This afternoon, temperature of air and water both 34 degrees, supporting the assumption. The wind has come fair and we are on our course again, going between seven and eight knots. Quantities of whale birds about the ship. The first full Mars and the first McCormick skua seen. Last night saw hourglass dolphins about. Sooty and black-browed albatross continue, with cape chickens. The cold makes people hungry, and one gets just a tremor on seeing the marvelous disappearance of consumables when our twenty-four young appetites have to be appeased. Last night I discussed the Western Geological Party, and explained to Ponting the desirability of his going with it. I had thought he ought to be in charge, as the oldest and most experienced traveler, and mentioned it to him, then to Griffith Taylor. The latter was evidently deeply disappointed, so we three talked the matter out between us, and pointing at once disclaimed any right and announced cheerful agreement with Taylor's leadership. It was a satisfactory arrangement, and shows Ponting in a very pleasant light. I'm sure he's a very nice fellow. I would record here a symptom of the spirit which actuates the men. After the gale, the main deck under the forecastle space in which the ponies are stabled leaked badly and the dirt of the stable leaked through on hammocks and bedding. Not a word has been said. The men living in that part have done their best to fend off the nuisance with oilskins and canvas, but without a sign of complaint. Indeed, the discomfort throughout the mess deck has been extreme. Everything has been thrown about. Water has found its way down in a dozen places. There is no daylight, and air can come only through the small forehatch. The artificial lamplight has given much trouble. The men have been wetted to the skin repeatedly on deck, and have no chance of drying their clothing. All things considered, their cheerful fortitude is little short of wonderful. First Ice There was a report of ice at dinner tonight. Evans corroborated Cheatham's statement that there was a berg far away to the west, showing now and again as the sun burst through the clouds. Thursday, December 8. 63 degrees, 20 minutes, and 177 degrees, 22 minutes. South 31, east 138 minutes, to circle 191 minutes. The wind increased in the first watch last night to a moderate gale. The ship, close hauled, held within two points of her course. Top gallant sails and mainsail were furled, and later in the night the wind gradually crept ahead. At 6 a.m. we were obliged to furl everything, and throughout the day we have been plunging against a stiff breeze and moderate sea. This afternoon, by keeping a little to eastward of the course, we have managed to get fore and aft sail filled. The barometer has continued its steady upward path for 24 hours. It shows signs of turning, having reached within one-tenth of 30 inches. It was light throughout last night, always a cheerful condition. But this headwind is trying to the patients, more especially as our coal expenditure is more than I estimated. 
we manage 62 or 63 revolutions on about 9 tons, but have to distill every three days at expense of half a ton. And then there is a weekly half ton for the cook. It is certainly a case of fighting one's way south. I was much disturbed last night by the motion. The ship was pitching and twisting with short, sharp movements on a confused sea, and with every plunge my thoughts flew to our poor ponies. This afternoon they are fairly well, but one knows that they must be getting weaker as time goes on, and one longs to give them a good sound rest with the ship on an even keel. Poor patient beasts! One wonders how far the memory of such fearful discomfort will remain with them. Animals so often remember places and conditions where they have encountered difficulties or hurt. Do they only recollect circumstances which are deeply impressed by some shock of fear or sudden pain? And does the remembrance of prolonged strain pass away? Who can tell? But it would seem strangely merciful if nature should blot out these weeks of slow but inevitable torture. The dogs are in great form again. For them, the greatest circumstance of discomfort is to be constantly wet. It was this circumstance, prolonged throughout the gale, which nearly lost us our splendid leader, Osman. In the morning he was discovered utterly exhausted and only feebly trembling. Life was very nearly out of him. He was buried in hay and lay so for twenty-four hours, refusing food. The wonderful hardihood of his species was again shown by the fact that within another twenty-four hours he was, to all appearances, as fit as ever. Antarctic petrels have come about us. This afternoon one was caught. Later, about 7 p.m., Evan saw two icebergs far on the port beam. They could only be seen from the masthead. Whales have been frequently seen, Balenoptera sibaldi, supposed to be the biggest mammal that has ever existed. Footnote from Dr. Wilson's journal. We watched two or three immense blue whales at fairly short distance. This is Balenoptera sibaldi. One sees first a small dark hump appear, and then immediately a jet of gray fog squirted upwards fifteen to eighteen feet, gradually spreading as it rises vertically into the frosty air. I have been nearly in these blows once or twice, and had the moisture in my face with a sickening smell of shrimpy oil. Then the bump elongates, and up rolls an immense blue-gray or blackish-gray round back with a faint ridge along the top, on which presently appears a small hook-like dorsal fin, and then the hole sinks and disappears. End of footnote. Friday, December 9, 65 degrees, 8 minutes, and 177 degrees, 41 minutes. Made good, south 4, west 109 minutes. Scott Island, south 22, west 147 minutes. At 6 this morning, bergs and pack were reported ahead. At first we thought the pack might consist only of fragments of the bergs, but on entering a stream we found small, worn floes, the ice not more than two or three feet in thickness. I had hoped that we should not meet it till we reached latitude sixty-six and a half, or at least sixty-six. We decided to work to the south and west as far as the open water would allow, and have met with some success. At 4 p.m., as I write, we are still in open water, having kept a fairly straight course and come through five or six light streams of ice, none more than three hundred yards across. We have passed some very beautiful bergs, mostly tabula. The heights have varied from six to eighty feet, and I am getting to think that this part of the Antarctic yields a few bergs of greater altitude. Two bergs deserve some description. One, passed very close on port hand in order that it might be cinematographed, was about eighty feet in height and tabula. It seemed to have been calved at a comparatively recent date. The above picture shows its peculiarities and points to the desirability of close examination of other berg faces. There seemed to be a distinct difference of origin between the upper and lower portions of the berg, as though a land glacier had been covered by a layer and layer of seasonal snow. Then again, what I have described as intrusive layers of blue ice was a remarkable feature. One could imagine that these layers represent surfaces which have been transformed by regulation under hot sun and wind. This point required investigation. The second berg was distinguished by innumerable vertical cracks. These seemed to run criss-cross and to weaken the structure, so that the various seracs formed by them had bent at different angles and shapes, giving a very irregular surface to the berg, and a face scarred with immense vertical fissures. One imagines that such a berg has come from a region of ice disturbance, such as King Ledwood's land. 
We have seen a good many whales today, rorquals with high black spouts, Balanoptera sibaldi. The birds with us, Antarctic and snow petrel, a fulmar, and this morning cape pigeon. We have pack ice further north than expected, and it's impossible to interpret the fact. One hopes that we shall not have anything heavy, but I'm afraid there's not much to build upon. 10 p.m. We have made good progress throughout the day, but the ice streams thicken as we advance, and on either side of us the pack now appears in considerable fields. We still pass quantities of bergs, perhaps nearly one-half the number tabula, but the rest worn and fantastic. The sky has been wonderful, with every form of cloud and every condition of light and shade. The sun has continually appeared through breaks in the cloudy heavens from time to time, brilliantly illuminating some field of pack, some steep-walled berg, or some patch of bluest sea. So sunlight and shadow have chased each other across our scene. Tonight there is little or no swell. The ship is on an even keel, steady save for the occasional shocks of striking ice. It is difficult to express the sense of relief the steadiness gives after our storm-tossed passage. One can only imagine the relief and comfort afforded to the ponies. But the dogs are visibly cheered, and the human element is full of gaiety. The voyage seems full of promise in spite of the imminence of delay. If the pack becomes thick, I shall certainly put the fires out and wait for it to open. I do not think it ought to remain close for long in this meridian. Tonight we must be beyond the 66th parallel. Saturday, December 10. Dead reckoning, 66 degrees, 38 minutes. Longitude 178 degrees, 47 minutes. Made good, south 17, west 94. Sea Crozier, 688 minutes. Stayed on deck till midnight. The sun just dipped below the southern horizon. The scene was incomparable. The northern sky was gloriously rosy and reflected in the calm sea between the ice, which varied from burnished copper to salmon pink. Bergs and packs to the south had a pale greenish hue with deep purple shadows. The sky shaded to saffron and pale green. We gazed long at these beautiful effects. The ship made through leads during the night. Morning found us pretty well at the end of the open water. We stopped to water ship from a nice hummockly fall. We made about eight tons of water. Rennick took a sounding, 1,960 fathoms. The tube brought up two small lumps of volcanic lava with the usual Glubergina ooze. Wilson shot a number of Antarctic petrel and snowy petrel. Nelson got some crustaceans and other beasts with a vertical tow net and got a water sample in temperatures at 400 meters. The water was warmer at that depth. About 1.30 we proceeded at first through fairly easy pack, then in amongst very heavy old flows grouped about a big berg. We shot out of this and made a detour, getting easier going. But though the flows were less formidable as we proceeded south, pack grew thicker. I noticed large flows of comparatively thin ice very sodden and easily split. These are similar to some we went through in the Discovery, but tougher by a month. At three we stopped and shot four crab-eater seals. Tonight we had the livers for dinner. They were excellent. Tonight we are in very close pack. It is doubtful if it is worth pushing on, but an arch of clear sky which is shown to the southward all day makes me think that there must be clearer water in that direction, perhaps only some twenty miles away, but twenty miles is much under present conditions. As I came below to bed at eleven p.m., Bruce was slogging away, making fair progress, but now and again brought up altogether. I noticed the ice was becoming much smoother and thinner, with occasional signs of pressure between which the ice was very thin. We had been very carefully into all the evidence of former voyages to pick the best meridian to go south on, and I thought, and still think, that the evidence points to the 178 west as the best. We entered back more or less on this meridian, and have been rewarded by encountering worse conditions than any ships had before. Worse, in fact, than I imagined would have been impossible on any other meridian of those which we could have chosen. To understand the difficulty of the position, you must appreciate what the pack is and how little is known of its movements. The pack in this part of the world consists, one, of the ice which has formed over the sea on the fringe of the Antarctic continent during the last winter, two, of very heavy old ice flows which have broken out of bays and inlets during the previous summer, but have not had time to get north before the winter set in, three, 
a comparatively heavy ice formed over the Ross Sea earlier in the last winter, and four of comparatively thin ice which is formed over parts of the Ross Sea in middle or towards the end of the last winter. Undoubtedly, throughout the winter, all ice sheets move and twist, tear apart and press into ridges, and thousands of bergs charge through these sheets, raising hummocks and lines of pressure and mixing things up. Then, of course, where such rents are made in the winter, the sea freezes again, forming a newer and thinner sheet. With the coming of summer, the northern edge of the sheet decays, and the heavy ocean swell penetrates it, gradually breaking it into smaller and smaller fragments. Then the whole body moves to the north, and the swell of the Ross Sea attacks the southern edge of the pack. This makes it clear why at the northern and southern limits, the pieces or ice flows are comparatively small, whilst in the middle the flows may be two or three miles across and why the pack may and does consist of various natures of ice flows in extraordinary confusion. Further, it will be understood why the belt grows narrower and the flows thinner and smaller as the summer advances. We know that where thick pack may be found early in January, open water and a clear sea may be found in February, and broadly that the later the date, the easier the chance of getting through. A ship going through the pack must either break through the flows push them aside or go round them, observing that she cannot push flows which are more than two or three hundred yards across. Whether a ship can get through or not depends on the thickness and nature of the ice, the size of the flows and the closeness with which they are packed together, as well as on her own power. The situation of the main bodies of pack and the closeness with which the flows are packed depend almost entirely on the prevailing winds. One cannot tell what winds have prevailed before one's arrival, Therefore, one cannot know much about the situation or density. Within limits, the density is changing from day to day and even from hour to hour. Such changes depend on the wind, but it may not necessarily be a local wind, so that at times they seem almost mysterious. One sees the flows pressing closely against one another at a given time, and an hour or two afterwards a gap of a foot or more may be seen between each. When the flows are pressed together, it is difficult, sometimes impossible, to force a way through. But when there is release of pressure, the sum of many little gaps allows one to take a zigzag path. End of chapter 1 Recording by Ross Clough, Stoughton, Massachusetts